grace and peace be to you from God our Father, from our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Yesterday, St. Peter's had Family and Friends Day for our day school, and I got the privilege of doing chapel, and I got to mention to those gathered yesterday that I hope you can come back today and join us so church can be this full as it was yesterday. I'm happy to report I see so many faces that I saw yesterday. Uh, thank you for being here as we give praise to our God who loves his people. Today as a nation, we celebrate Thanksgiving. A day for many of you is going to mean you get to go over the river and through the woods to grandmother's house you'll go. Today is a day that you're going to celebrate with family and friends. A day that you're going to eat lots and lots and lots of food. It's a day to watch Thanksgiving Day parades. A day to cheer on football. Even the Bears and Packers are playing. Today is going to be a day that hopefully you'll get an after turkey nap. Maybe even an early Black Friday day of shopping. But it's going to be a day where you are going to reflect on all the blessings you've received this year. And by golly, have God's people been blessed tremendously this year. But today is also a day that the church gathers. The church gathers in this place as we recognize that all of the blessings that we have are truly a gift from our Heavenly Father's holy hand. And so we give thanks for all the blessings that he gives to his people. One of the blessings that he gives is his word. It's a life-giving word for his people. We hear that word this morning from Deuteronomy chapter 8. And in Deuteronomy 8, the Lord says to his people, the people of Israel, I have blessed you. Now follow my commands, and I'll continue to bless you, letting you enter the promised land. We know that these words God spoke to the people of Israel aren't just for them, but they're words for us this very day. The Lord says, I have blessed you, now follow my commands, and I'll continue to bless you. This word of God kind of has me wondering, asking this question, is it actually possible for God's people to follow all of his commands? I think perhaps one answer to that question is yes. I think that might hurt your Lutheran ears. But contemplate that with me for a second. I bet that most people in this room don't read their Bible every day. I bet that's a fair assessment. Maybe you haven't even read it this week. Perhaps you haven't read it all month or maybe even longer than that. I bet there are people in this room who aren't in Bible class every week like they should be. I bet there are people in this room who have not said their prayers as often as God would want them to pray. I know that we're a people who have time on our hands. We spend time watching TV, reading books and the like. Maybe, just maybe, if we were a people who read our Bibles all the time, who said prayers every day, who spent time in God's word, who donated all that free time here at church so that we could always have our eyes focused on Jesus. Maybe, just maybe, we could be faithful. Maybe we could never actually break one of God's commands, but we could actually follow all of them perfectly. Martin Luther tried this. He joined a monastery. He isolated himself from the outside world so he could focus all of his attention on his God. Martin Luther's a guy, if you remember, he once said, you should never study the book of Revelation until you've memorized all of Romans. Martin Luther's a man who memorized all of Romans. I think our day school kids get kind of fussy when they have to memorize one or two verses. He memorized 16 chapters of Romans and so many other portions of scripture. Martin Luther was a guy who said, I don't have enough time in my day. So to make more time in his day, do you know what he did? He added three hours of prayer to his day. Can you imagine that? To make more time, you add three hours. Because he knew that if he was right with God, everything else would tend to work out. Martin Luther was faithful, probably one of the most faithful people that I think I've heard of. 
But what Martin Luther found out was, no matter how hard he tried, no matter how faithful he thought he could be, he'd never follow all of God's commands perfectly. So it might be tempting to answer that question of, is it possible to keep all of God's commands? With a simple yes. Well, we know that's just not the case. Perhaps then another answer to that question, is it possible to keep all of God's commands, is this. Maybe God makes meaningless threats. Maybe God's an old softy. He says things, but kind of like a bad parent, you just don't follow through. The kids can just kind of do whatever they want. Jonah thought this. Jonah, as he goes to Nineveh and preaches God's word that God is going to destroy this city in three days, well, 40 days actually, 40 days, uh, then God relents. God forgives the people, and God doesn't destroy the city. And Jonah thinks, God, you're just an old softy. It's meaningless threats. What was the point of me even coming to this city? I think there are people today who still think like Jonah thought. I think some of them are gathered here this morning, uh, probably myself included. And we like to justify our actions with this. Well, I'm a Christian. God's going to forgive me anyways. So it doesn't really matter what I do. God's not really going to punish me. But as we look at the scriptures, that's just not the case either. From the very beginning, God reminds us that he is a just and righteous God. God does not speak useless words. God keeps what he says. He told Adam and Eve in the garden, Do not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat of it, you'll surely die. And what does Eve say? Ah, God's an old softy. And she takes a bite of that fruit, and then things get hard for Adam and Eve. Kicked out of the garden. There's going to be pain in childbirth. It's going to be hard to work. And like God said, death enters into existence. You remember the story of the golden calf, right? God saves the people from Egypt. God brings them to Mount Sinai and he says to him, I will be your God and you will be my people. And you shall have no other gods but me. But then Moses goes up on a mountain. He's gone for 40 days, not 41 days. And you know what the people say? Aaron, build us a God. And Aaron makes a golden calf. And when God comes, God does not say, you know, it's not that big of a deal. No, God cares. 3,000 people will die that very day. They're going to grind up that golden calf, and all the people of Israel will have to eat it. God is a just God. God does not speak useless words. God does not make meaningless threats. So if we can't keep all of God's commands perfectly, and God actually cares about the things he says, then how in the world can we possibly keep God's commands so that he will continue to bless his people? Perhaps the best answer to that question is that you won't. You're not going to keep all of God's commands. In fact, these commands are going to stand as uh, condemnation for God's people. Martin Luther talks about this. It's the second function of the law. It stands as a mirror for us. These commands are going to constantly remind God's people that you've fallen short. And what they're going to remind you of is your utter dependence on your God. But your God who demands perfection, who demands perfect obedience for his people, becomes a people for himself. He sends Jesus to put on the flesh so that Jesus can become perfect for us. And Jesus is going to go to Jerusalem for us. He's going to die for us so that our sins might be forgiven. And it's through Jesus that these commands are going to be kept. It's through Jesus that God is going to continue to bless his people. The Lord blesses ancient Israel. He gives them the promised land. And the Lord blesses us too with this promised land, not a physical land, but the eternal blessings of our God, forgiveness of our sins, new life in him, restoration, making all things new, life and salvation with our God who loves us. It's through Jesus that God blesses us. 
So many blessings that he gives. Uh, we see the earthly blessings here before us. You'll see him today at your house, at the table, the turkey, the potatoes, the football, the parades, the family, the friends, the house, the home, the clothing, the shoes, all that you have. Certainly good and gracious gifts from your God. But the church on this Thanksgiving day remembers the eternal blessings from our God. That through Jesus, our God grants to us even greater things than Turkey. He grants to us forgiveness and life in him. So on this Thanksgiving day, as you celebrate with family and fellowship and football, may you keep your eyes on the giver of these good and gracious gifts, giving thanks to the one whom gifts flow, to Jesus, the one who promises you blessings here in this life and the life to come. Amen. Now may the grace of God that surpasses all understanding guard your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus.